planning approaches for assessing vulnerabilities and climate adaptation choices. And we have um, a consultant team present today, as well as the folks from Circa. Um, so Victoria, Noah, and I from Milo and McBroom are going to be running the controls and uh, facilitating breakout rooms and giving parts of the presentation, as well as Scott Choquette and Johanna Greenspan Johnston from Dewberry, who will be um, who are our teammates on this project and will be also facilitating breakout rooms. The objectives for today are to ground truth the, uh, the index that we're going to be talking about, the Climate Change Vulnerability Index, CCVI, discuss which pieces of the CCVI, or in other words, which contributors make the most sense for influencing the outcomes. And we'll be talking about this in extensively in a few minutes and also in the breakout rooms. So just park this in the back of your mind for now. We'll also discuss which pieces of the CCVI, which contributors make the most sense for influencing the tool's utility for future planning. Uh, we're going, going to go through the zones of shared risk concept and look at preliminary uh, zones of shared risk for the region, and then kind of get positioned for the next steps, which we will explain to you as we move through the workshop. Here's the schedule for today. Um, Noah will be running the Zoom controls and putting you into breakout rooms when we get to the two points in time, 10 o'clock and also um, 11 o'clock. And if you need to take breaks throughout the presentation, please do so. Um, you're welcome to, to come, come back on if you need to attend to something urgent. Um, if you can be present though, when we put people into breakout rooms, that's always helpful because then you'll make sure you're in the right one. If you have te technical problems or issues, please send a message to Noah in the chat box, reach out to him that way and he will try to help you, assist you with whatever the problem is. Um, if something kicks us all out of the workshop, Wait a couple minutes, then log back in, and we'll get restarted. John, I will give you privileges at the moment to share your screen. All righty. Good morning, everybody. Thanks for joining us on a Monday morning after the Super Bowl. Um, so I'm just going to give a very short uh, presentation just to uh, remind everybody what Resilient Connecticut is all about and for some folks that maybe are less familiar with it. Um, so this workshop is part of a series of workshops that's uh, part of Resilient Connecticut. And Resilient Connecticut is uh, one piece of the state of Connecticut's program through the National Disaster Resilience Competition. And another big piece of that, which some folks um, from Metrocog region should be familiar with is Resilient Bridgeport. And Resilient Bridgeport was, or is the, um, the pilot project that was funded uh, to build a coastal flood defense system and um, raise some, some corridors and develop a resilient center in the south end of Bridgeport. And then our piece of it um, at UConn and Circa and working with the consultant team is, is Resilient Connecticut, which is um, really looking across Fairfield and New Haven counties um, and looking for opportunities to develop projects and do the type of planning that um, enabled Resilient Bridgeport to move forward, um, develop some of the, the technical support and the capacity building and mapping, um, which we're gonna talk about today um, and then ultimately develop other pilot projects in the region um, that combine some of the different themes that are that are part of this project. Um, and we're working pretty closely with, or you know, originally this was sort of conceived as a as a partnership across different state agencies, um, and working with uh, the Cogs and working with municipalities. And Resilient Bridgeport really is an example of that as well. You have a uh, Department of Housing working with the city of Bridgeport. Um, Department of Transportation has come in to do some of the heavy lifting on the, the construction. So that's that's sort of our, our um, organizational structure. Um, you know, part of phase one of Resilient Connecticut was to develop a planning framework. Um, I will put a link in the chat to the uh, document that kind of outlines the planning framework if people want to take a look more uh, closer look at it. But essentially the, the a long-term vision for establishing resilient communities in Connecticut um, is 
what is built in there and includes these themes. Um, so first is focusing community development where we can around transit and really thinking about um, planning and projects that would support development that um, supports transit. Uh, creating corridors resilient to climate change and really thinking about emergency access and egress routes in the short term and then long term really thinking about um, focusing development across the state to areas that are um, inherently resilient to the impacts of climate change, um, whether through their elevation um, or through some project uh, elements that are developed. Uh, creating opportunities for affordable housing and really looking at places where there is affordable housing, how can we preserve um, and enhance those communities and um, enable other opportunities for affordable housing. Um, looking at energy, economic and social resilience. So looking at um, utility infrastructure, water, um, energy, um, how can we fold those elements into this, this planning? Um, looking at the economic development opportunities, um, how our communities in Connecticut are planning to grow and uh, you know where are the economic development opportunities across the region. And then looking at social resilience. So thinking about the role of equity, um, thinking about environmental justice um, as a key component to establishing a resilient community. Um, looking at transit connectivity. So increasing the, um, the ability to connect to transit um, between transit nodes and then where there are structures and critical infrastructure in the flood zone, what can we do to adapt, um, whether through elevation or um, infrastructure development? Um, and then ultimately really thinking about the role of um, natural function of coastal floodplains and riparian buffers, and really thinking about the role of healthy ecosystems in uh, making our communities resilient in the long term. Um, so the timeline for Resilient Connecticut, we're currently in phase two of the project and we're really uh, taking these first steps that this workshop today is a part of. So um, looking at this climate change vulnerability index that we're developing, and then looking at the identification of zones of shared risk, this concept of zones of shared risk that we're gonna talk about a little bit more today as these are you know, kind of key stepping stones along the way to identifying um, projects where we can build in all of those different themes uh, in the framework. And then ultimately starting this late spring, we're gonna transition to phase three of Resilient Connecticut and that's gonna be focused more on um, feasibility studies and, and doing some initial design work around specific pilot projects. Um, and so that's the quick overview and um, I'm going to pass it back to Dave. Take it away. Hey, John, have just a, one more release there before I, there we go. All right, I've got just two slides before we go back over to the CCVI. All right, so just picking up where John left off, where are we today? So we're kind of in the middle of this, uh, these three steps on the screen here. We've, we've done a lot of work with Circa over the past few months, gathering data from them, from the state, from um, state agencies and from the hazard mitigation plans and from the COGS. We've taken all that and we're working on task four right now, which is identifying the challenges. And when I say, where are we today? You know, that's really today. This workshop is part of this, this central column here, developing a regional risk assessment and identifying zones of shared risk. So you're helping us do that. And where we go next, so after today will be the final column here, opportunities, where we identify the opportunities to address the climate change challenges uh, in the four COGS that we're working with. Um, so I'm going to let Victoria take over at this point, and we're going to hear about the CCVI before the breakout room is about the CCVI. All right, thank you very much. <clears throat> um, okay, so I'm going to go over quickly 
the uh, do a quick presentation and then I'll introduce you all uh, quickly to the mapping tool. Um, so hopefully everybody received kind of a pre-workshop email for those that registered late on Friday afternoon may not have received it, um, but that's okay. We're gonna go through the mapping tool during the breakouts as well. So, all right, so we're gonna talk a little bit about the climate change vulnerability index, um, a little bit of what it is and how to use it. Uh, we'll be talking about how we'll be using it in Resilient Connecticut, but also how, you know, ultimately stakeholders um, down the road could use this tool. <clears throat> so just to give a little background info, I'm sure some folks on the call have heard about the CCVI. Um, for those that haven't, you know, it's not this tool that's kind of popping out of nowhere. It's been slowly um, developed by Circa, and we're now kind of expanding what they've developed. So uh, the CVI, the Coastal Vulnerability Index that you could see, we've got a graphic here of this viewer, uh, was developed by Circa. So we're taking this and we're expanding on it. Um, there are some similarities between the CCVI and the CVI, um, but there's also, you know, some additions, right? Like I said, we're expanding on this. So uh, the similarities are that we are looking at built social, ecological, climate, and physical uh, factors throughout the region. Uh, we're also using the same methodology. So we're using um, this idea of these gridded 10 acre cells um, to display and convey the data that's kind of, you know, underlying for this tool. Uh, we're using the same equation, so sensitivity plus exposure um, minus adaptive capacity, right? So taking kind of those two, um, you know, negative factors, sensitivity and exposure, um, but outweighing adaptive capacity, right? The capability to kind of rebound and recover. Um, and then most of the same data we're using, but again, because we're expanding, we're incorporating a lot of new data. We're moving this in from coastal um, into inland communities, uh, riverine communities. We're also looking at heat and wind, so a couple different types of um, indices. Um, and again, we're incorporating more data, right? We're expanding this, especially because of heat and wind um, and then, you know, the riverine changes. So what is the CCVI? Quite literally, we can say it's a composite of several factors to quantify climate vulnerability. But what does that mean in, in the context of Resilient Connecticut um, or your potential future work? Um, it's a planning tool that can be used to identify vulnerability drivers. So I'm thinking back to that last graphic of the CVI, um, into kind of this, this purple array that we have here. Um, it's just a lot of grid cells, right? But if we think about this as kind of this planning tool plane, um, there's a lot going on below this plane. And then there's also a lot that we might want to include on top of this plane, right? It's not necessarily a standalone tool. So we might have our CCVI. We might want to take a look at some of the zones of shared risk that are also being developed, which we'll talk about in a little while. We might want to take a look at, you know, hazard mitigation plans, um, priority actions, CRB priority actions, where are those located throughout the region or throughout your, your study area. We might want to take a look at some other data types that haven't necessarily been included in the CCVI. Um, some data types are just a little more subjective, so we can't necessarily, um, you know, rank them adequately or, you know, rank them for every type of work that they would be used for. Right, so then this is everything we would include on top, but there's a lot going in underneath that's really driving these, these color differences and these patterns that we're seeing. People, climate, weather, um, ecological uh, factors as well. So we're gonna be talking about what's kind of going into the CCVI, what's going on underneath. So we have our equation, like I mentioned, sensitivity plus exposure minus adaptive capacity. So it's important when you're thinking about these three, um, you know, these three indicators, that there's a lot going into each, right? So there's several um, contributors going into each um, indicator, right? So a few factors going into sensitivity, a few going into exposure, and then a few into adaptive capacity, which I'll start to kind of introduce now. So the mapping tool, like I said, if you had a chance to take a look at it, this might look familiar. If not, um, no worries, we'll, we'll dive into this a little bit more. So uh, first we have sensitivity. So taking a look at the degree to which a built, a natural, or a human system will be impacted by changes in climate conditions. Um, so what did we look at here? We looked at built, social, and ecological contributors. So <clears throat> um, I do have a few polls. So I'm gonna launch each poll as I kind of go into what's on the slide here. So <clears throat> for sensitivity, so you should see this poll. So what we wanna to try to gauge an idea of is, um, you know, these are all the different data types that we used. And these, these are flood specific. We're gonna be talking about flood today. Uh, we looked at built and social and ecological. So for example, you know, how sensitive is building density or private wells or our railways and our roadways? Are they in the special flood hazard area? Are they not? 
what are the social um, components, you know, the social populations we have in the certain region based on income, you know, disability, number per household, uh, access to transportation, and then also the ecological sensitivities, right? What types of habitats? Uh, we have the NDDB areas, so the natural diversity database areas, which identify critical species of any type. You know, do we have those types of areas? Um, so all of these are given a certain rank kind of on how sensitive they are. So we want to gauge for sensitivity. Um, how influential do you think these kind of overall general um, you know, contributors are to identifying vulnerability, whether it's in your municipality or throughout the region, um, you know, and, and ultimately, you know, statewide. Um, you know, again, we wanna, we wanna make sure that this tool is being developed. So when we do identify pilot project areas for Resilient Connecticut, that we're really incorporating, um, you know, the data sets that are important to stakeholders, to communities and, and to the region. I'll give everybody a minute there. Um, I'll, I'll pick a couple just to elaborate on more, but let us know on a scale of one to five um, how influential you think you know the built or the social and the ecological factors are here. Um, so, like I said, you know we took a look at railways, we took a look at roadways, um, how um, you know whether or not those are in the special flood hazard area. Oh, it looks like hold on. Having a glitch here. Something happened with my polling. I'm not sure if it got relaunched. Uh, taking a look at railways, roadways, um, how sensitive they are, whether they're in the special flood hazard area. The same with private wells. Are they in, you know, um, special flood hazard area? Um, living below poverty level. Let's see. There was a couple that I think I. Oh no, they're grouped in the. Um, they're grouped in the polling. Um, but again, median income. You know, these are all tract level census data. So taking a look at. Um, you know, what populations are where throughout the region. Sorry, folks, it looks like my poll might have got reset. So I'll give everybody just a few more seconds on this one, but then we'll keep moving. Um, and then again, you know, critical habitats. So how, um, you know, how vulnerable, how sensitive are they to flooding? Are they able to rebound quickly? Um, you know, if they become inundated, are they a little more sensitive to, you know, the flooding impacts? Um, and similar with land cover, developed versus, you know, open fields, things like that. All right, so taking a look at the sensitivity results. Um, so uh, how, how influential do you think the social contributors are? Uh, most folks kind of agree, moderate to a lot. Um, how influential do you think the bill? It looks like we had a, a majority for, um, most folks think they're pretty influential. And then uh, similar with ecological, right? So, so a lot, which isn't the best English, but pretty influential. So that's good. You know, taking a look at these results will, you know, help us um, finalize the CCBI and, and kind of finish the development. Let's take a look at exposure. So what did we put into our exposure grid? Uh, we took a look at climate and physical. So the degree of the stress that the particular asset is going through with climate vulnerability. Um, so this includes the change and the magnitude and the frequency of extreme events. So keeping all of these sensitivity layers in the back of our minds, right? Um, the exposure is essentially, uh, you know, what's impacting that sensitivity, what's kind of, you know, uh, driving that sensitivity. And you'll see a, a slightly different, um, fewer data sets, but a slightly different trend here. So we're not really talking about the people as much. We're not talking about, you know, the, um, we are talking about the landscape still, but in a slightly different manner. So I'll launch this poll again for exposure. Let's see if I can do this one seamlessly now. Um, so again, how influential do you think the climate and the physical factors are here? So we're taking a look at our FEMA flood zones. Uh, we're taking a look at sea level rise projections, storm surge, and tidal range. And then for the physical, we took a look at pooling areas. So um, extracting the elevation throughout the region and identifying these small sinks, whether they're rural or urban. Um, you know, and, uh, taking out lakes and, and, you know, ponds and things like that. But, you know, more of those, you know, kind of developed area pooling areas taking a look at erosion susceptibility or soil drainage, so incorporating some of these soil properties, um, and then impervious surface density. So taking a look at roadways, buildings, um, you know, especially in regard to like flash flooding, or looking at that in conjunction with those pooling areas, right? So again, how influential do you think these are? I'll give everybody a few seconds on this one. This is a little bit shorter. Um, and then there'll be some, you know, during the breakouts, if, if we're missing something, you know, keep that in the back of your mind. We want to make sure that, um, you know, we didn't miss any glaring, glaringly obvious uh, data sets, right? If, if there's something seems to be missing here, you know, let us know. We're, we're going to be reworking the CCBI based on this workshop and based on the feedback. Um, so, you know, we want to make sure we're, we're getting 
you know, getting info from you folks. So let's see, how are we doing? All right, we've got a few more seconds here. It looks like most answers are coming in. Give everybody a few seconds and then we'll look at adaptive capacity and then I'll do a quick intro for the mapping. All right, let's take a look here. I'll give it 10 more seconds. That'll bring us to two minutes. All right. All right, so how influential do you think um, climate factors are? Uh, most people agree they're pretty influential as well as the physical factors. Good. So again, telling us that we're not, you know, missing the mark here, which is um, reassuring. Thank you. And again, if we're missing anything, let us know. <clears throat> um, and then lastly, adaptive capacity. So uh, this is us taking a look at, you know, some of the different factors and the contributors that are in place um, for, again, both built, social, and ecological. Um, so the ability of the system to adjust to changes, manage damages, um, and then take advantage of opportunities or cope with consequences. So again, we looked at built, social, and ecological. I'll launch my poll here again. We've got our last one for this. And then go into uh, a little more on these. So, you know, taking a look at the built, we've got our coastal structures, our riverine flood protection systems, right? So those kind of hardened structure, structures that we have in place. We took a look at, uh, you know, community access to some of the resources. So distance to hospitals, shelters, or major roads, if we're talking about, you know, sheltering needs or evacuation needs. Certain populations that are closer, you know, are a little bit more adaptive. Taking a look at low impact development, uh, where that's been uh, implemented throughout the region. Also taking a look at public water, uh, public sewer, um, you know, whether those areas, whether it's uh, present in that area or not. We also took a look at some of the social factors. So flood policies in force, um, identifying how many flood policies are enforced per community in comparison to how many buildings are um, in the flood zones there. Communication systems, so whether you're on the state system, CT alert, whether some communities have a system or not. And then owner occupied housing. So again, another census tract. And then the ecological, so uh, resilient landscapes, right? There's a, a certain data set that um, you know, we, we identified so we can identify those types of landscapes that are a little more, you know, they bounce back in the wake of uh, flooding. They can handle it a little bit better. Um, and then open space and flood zones and then some marsh migration, so a coastal, um, a coastal data set. So again, helping us identify you know, the people and the built and the ecological um, capacity to which, you know, these systems can uh, recuperate or adapt to um, flooding. So same idea, how influential do you think these built social or ecological contributors are kind of in that general sense? Um, and then let's see, I've got 955 here. So we'll finish up with this poll and then I'll do a quick intro to the mapping um, and then we'll jump into the breakouts. I don't want to get too far into the breakout time. Um, so I'll give everybody a few seconds on that. And then we'll jump into the map. All right, in about 10 more seconds, it looks like I've got most everybody again. <clears throat> All right, let's take a look at these results. Okay. Um, so how influential do you think uh, built contributors are? Um, again, most folks moderately to a lot. Um, social, similar numbers. We're kind of kind of in the middle here on the social, it looks like. Um, and then ecological, we had a majority thinking that they're pretty influential. So again, you know, these seem like pretty simple, um, you know, kind of scale one to five uh, polls, but they're actually uh, pretty important for helping us, you know, develop these these final data sets. So thanks for Thank you for doing those. And then, okay, let me do a quick, quick re-swap here of my screen share. All right. Okay. <clears throat> All right. So, again, we're gonna we're gonna dive into this a little bit more um, during the breakouts, but just to give a kind of a general idea of 
you know, how to look at this tool and how to use this tool, right? We might not dive into all of it during the breakouts, but, um, you know, just to give a, a sense of what we'll be looking at. So again, we have kind of our general flood vulnerability layer here. So anything that's a little bit darker is considered more vulnerable in regard to the tool and to the statistics. Um, we have uh, everything is being ranked on a, a one to five for, well, for sensitivity, exposure, and adaptive capacity. So a five would mean that something is a little more sensitive or has a higher degree of exposure, but a five for adaptive capacity actually means, you know, it's good, right? It's, it's more adaptive. Um, so if we take a look at just our flood sensitivity component, right? So we have, you know, think again, these equations, we have our sensitivity plus our exposure minus our adaptive capacity. So we essentially have kind of a final score. So if I were to zoom into an area and click on a grid, you know, it gives us a bunch of numbers. This is a statistical analysis. So you can see here, we've got our, our, um, our ranking. So this is again, sensitivity, a higher being a little bit more vulnerable or a little bit more sensitive, lower meaning, um, you know, less sensitive. So again, this, there's a lot going on in this tool, but I think the important part um, you know, when we're talking about this during our breakouts is to really, you know, kind of stay back, take a step back and not necessarily look at the nitty gritty of each 10 acre grid cell, but really kind of look at the patterns. Um, you know, when we talk about exposure, it's pretty straightforward. You can really see the, a lot of the exposure, um, you know, follows along our rivers and our streams and then um, along the coastline. Um, but again, you know, taking, taking that kind of bird's eye view, right, we're really looking at um, you know, regional projects and kind of region, uh, regional resilience, right? So we want to take that regional look. Um, I know it's easy to, to kind of hone in on the smaller areas, but um, I'll, I'll, I'm going to cut myself off now. But um, again, kind of taking that general, general bird's eye view, um, you know, and we can take a look if there's a certain area that you want to talk about the sensitivity or the exposure um, or the adaptive capacity in the breakouts, let us know, you know, we can take a look at the numbers going into it, what's driving that sensitivity or what's driving that exposure. Um, so I'm going to stop myself now. We're at 9.59 and I want to make sure we have time for the breakouts. Um, again, very, very short overview for the map, but we, um, you know, we're going to go into it more. Uh, no, is everyone back? Just about. I think so. Uh, yeah, everyone should be back. Okay. No, you're quiet, but that's okay. Am I the regular volume? I'm, I'm okay, right? You are. My microphone was up. Sorry. Got it. All right, let's do a quick report out on these breakout rooms. And um, I guess I'll just go first uh, since we'll go, I guess we'll go from Fairfield over eastward. Um, so, team, I am pleased to say we found our first major bust after these workshops with the four cogs. It looks like there's possibly um, the floodways in the Fairfield are not being picked up and ranked higher than floodplains. In fact, maybe there's some missing data there entirely. So we need to go back and take a look at why areas along floodways are not um, ranked higher. Um, that's kind of the big the big first takeaway, we started in inland areas, Rooster River and some of the tributary streams and found that. Um, so we wanna take a look at that. Uh, we did move down towards the shoreline after, after looking at the riverine areas and spent a lot of time in the, in the broad coastal floodplain in Fairfield, looking at diversity of colors in the three different layers, adaptive capacity, sensitivity, and um, exposure, trying to figure out you know, why one cell would be a darker color and one right next to it would be a lighter color. And we found some things that made sense. For example, if there's tidal wetlands versus no tidal wetlands, uh, building density. One of the questions that came out of that was, how are we calculating building density? Are we using zoning or land use or actual building footprints in the grid cell? So we wanna take a look at that and make sure that we're doing that accurately. We also might wanna clip some of the, the areas that are mostly water so they don't kind of distract us and pull the ranking away from, from what we're trying to do. Um, but in general, I think one thing that we're finding in, the, in this broad coastal floodplain in Fairfield, because the, the risks, the actual risks are so uniform throughout that area, is it's kind of leading us towards the thing that we're trying to, to get at here, which is do we provide weighting or coefficients to some of the layers to make them more important? And I think I can speak for the town when I say that they like to see kind of a more uniform profile of risk in the coastal floodplain, it shouldn't be so so checkerboard for some of the um, 
for some of the parts of the equation. So we want to take a good look at that going forward. And um, unrelated to any of that, Laura Pooley let us know that they've been installing porous pavement in the railroad parking lot, which is really good news. Okay. All right. Um, so I think the general consensus is there's a really good planning. Uh, tool. There was some discussion about how it may be too complicated to communicate to the public and, and to elected officials using the using the tool if you don't have the time to, to deep dive into it. Uh, interesting question came up about uh, whether we could potentially add analysis of debris on the shoreline uh, during storms and the, the problems that that, that causes and reference was made to, to Sandy and some of the problems that they had in New Jersey with, with debris and whether that should be factored in. Um, we had a, a healthy discussion about um, using, you know, as a planning tool versus a regulatory tool and how the development community would probably um, not be interested in, in uh, some of the additional data that's in it if it's not specifically uh, related to development. Um, we had talked about whether and to what degree code compliance uh, is included in adaptive capacity. Um, the uh, wildlife connectivity corridors, uh, the Trumbull and Monroe Wildlife Corridor along the Pequonic and a watershed plan uh, that's in place there and that is reviewed annually and how that could be uh, potentially potentially added to the sensitivity and other layers to supplement the MDDS data. And then um, more related to the tool itself, uh, we looked at some of the contributors in each of the categories, talked about the, the naming convention that comes up when you click on a, on a cell and also it was suggested that maybe the bulleted sensitivities or the bulleted contributors in the description on the left might be turned to the button so you could click on to bring you to certain certain areas that were uh, sensitive or vulnerable um, based on that particular contributor. Johanna or Katie, did I miss anything? Only that um, one of our participants was actually from New Jersey and they pointed out in the chat box, if anyone's interested, a, um, a study that they did in transportation uh, and transportation corridors and looking at different vulnerabilities um, using similar criteria to how they're understanding this project. So it could be another you know, potential model for, um, for what another state has done using similar tools as this. So it's in the chat. Yeah, if you if you can't if it's not in the overall chat, let us know. But it's also if you want to Google it, it's the Passaic River Watershed Resilience Study. All right, I can do Stratford. Um, so we had some pretty good discussion on, um, you know, how this tool. Um, you know, kind of prioritizes projects. Uh, you know, we, we took a quick look into social, um, you know, the different types of sensitivities and the different scores, but the question was raised, you know, how does, how could this impact uh, funding? You know, on a smaller scale, we talked about the Sikorsky Airport, um, you know, the flood risks are known there, the risks are known there, but, um, you know, if it's not identified as highly vulnerable, could this impact flooding? So then that kind of shifted into the waiting conversation. Um, you know, do we assign different weights to different, uh, you know, different factors, whether it's built or social, um, kind of uh, on that aspect. Um, and then uh, we talked about incorporating how the Sikorsky Airport Master Plan uh, kind of coincided with, uh, you know, municipal actions. And so we actually had a, a pretty great list of some of the, some of the activities going on uh, in Stratford, such as some marsh restoration, um, you know, uh, let's see, home elevations, things like that, and how uh, the Sikorsky Master Plan can, um, you know, help identify some of the Coastal Resilience Plan actions and Hazard Mitigation Plan actions and kind of work together, um, which I think is pretty important because I, overall we're trying to achieve some of those actions in, with this project. Um, so knowing that all these planning efforts are coming together is, is really great. Um, and then one question was raised about what type of flooding is being incorporated into the CCBI. 
um, Harold noted that, you know, washover flooding was a, a pretty big concern in, in Southern Stratford and the Lower Sip area. You know, so we talked about how uh, flooding has been, is being taken into account from different aspects, whether it's coastal riverine, um, you know, or poor drainage. Um, so a lot, of, a lot of good conversation about kind of what's happening in Stratford and, and how the tool can be used. I think that was the general gist. Joanna, John, catch me if I missed anything. That was great. I just would add about what the conversation about how the CCVI fits into the larger project. And because when we have these larger regional issues of an infrastructure facility that's in a, a, a peninsula that is at highly at risk from flooding um, and sort of trying to think regionally about those solutions and that plays right, into right. our looking at zones of shared risk and then building resilience opportunities to solve those larger scale problems that are not um, can't be solved by just building, building a, a barrier um, to the flooding. Right. Thank you. I'm going to take a few minutes to explain the concept of zones of shared risk, and then um, hopefully in that time I'll figure out why I cannot reestablish my video, but I know the screen is sharing, so we're not in trouble yet. Um, so, there we go. Thank you. I'm not sure what that was. So this is a planning approach for climate adaptation, sort of like the CCVIs. And there's a lot of words in the screen, so we're breaking the first rule of PowerPoint here. Um, but what I thought would be important to do is explain that this concept of zones of shared risk is kind of really enumerated in the resilient kinetic background. And it's an important component of it. It's a cornerstone, really. So the project as, as a whole, as John explained, is trying to identify resilient hubs, resilient corridors, and the zones of shared risk are fundamental to that. So the planning approach connects zones of shared risk with resilient corridors to link critical facilities, and provide greater continuity service to at-risk communities. So right there, you can see uh, the, the project is, is predicated partly on understanding where these zones of shared risk are. Here's some definitions that you can also find um, in the literature and CERCA's website, et cetera. So zones of shared risk are regions that face common challenges, either already or uh, increasing over time from climate change. A lot of the original definitions I will mention to you have the word coastal in them, but uh, our job has been to kind of march this concept upstream and make sure that we identify zones of shared risk in communities that are not coastal along the shoreline. So back, uh, I can't believe it's been eight, nine years since we worked on the Guilford Coastal Resilience Plan. Um, we worked on this plan uh, with the Nature Conservancy and Yale, uh, Alex Felsen, when he was with Yale. And he identified uh, four kinds of zones of shared risk. And we'll go through those, those four types right now. So the location zone of shared risk is pretty much what it sounds like. So this is a zone of shared risk that is identified by virtue of being on a flood zone. And again, with Guilford, we were focused on coastal areas, but we know we can use this concept in riverine areas as well. So the location zones of shared risk are basically sitting in a current or future floodplain. Whereas an access zone of shared risk, these are areas that may, they may be floodplains, but they may not be. They may be high ground beyond a floodplain. And when a flood occurs, either coastal or riverine, access is impeded and people cannot get away from there to, to evacuate to a shelter or emergency services cannot be brought to the neighborhood because they're cut off. So again, first two types, location and access zones. And we've got proximity zones of shared risk. So this is, again, just kind of what it sounds like. These are areas that are adjacent to uh, areas that flood frequently. And the thought is that over time, uh, flood risk will increase in these areas because of their um, proximity to areas that flood currently. And then finally, we have natural protection zones of shared risk. So these are areas that um, are natural uh, in, in their current state. We would like to keep them that way because they provide some buffer to us. Um, they, development cannot occur in these areas because we've set them aside and protected them, but they also provide some buffering from flooding when flooding does occur. So if you take a look at Guilford, this is a snapshot from its coastal resilience plan. You can see some of these areas kind of sketched out and I'll just draw your attention to two of them really. So at the bottom of the screen, perhaps you're familiar with Sachem's head. Um, it's an area, kind of a peninsula in Guilford. It's got that gray color, a brown gray color with an SH on it for Sachem's head. And this is a, an access zone of shared risk. So a lot of the homes are high. They don't themselves flood, but um, 
nobody can get out of there when Route 146 floods, which occurs frequently. If you look to the right, uh, upper right hand side of the graphic, um, SV, the Soundview area, that's an industrial park, commercial industrial park in Guilford. And that is a collection of uh, non-residential commercial industrial properties that are sitting right next to tidal wetlands. So they have um, a proximity uh, risk, but also location risk. And, um, and there's also some of the tidal wetland buffering that, that's going on. So kind of a combination of risk, risk profiles uh, in that SVA. So a couple interesting things about zones of shared risk, they kind of give us a good spatial scale for planning. So they're at a scale that we can picture. We can think about um, neighborhoods or groups of neighborhoods. We can also think about areas that span town lines. So they kind of give us an unencumbered uh, spatial scale that we can work with. There's also kind of an implication of a systems approach. So a zone of shared risk will sh we'll share physical attributes or social attributes that kind of make them um, have a certain character. And, and because of that, we can think about how a zone of shared risk uh, going forward, we can leverage existing social institutions to kind of reduce the risk. So for example, one zone of shared risk could share one shelter, or maybe two zones of shared risk share the same shelter. So there's kind of a, uh, a workable um, character to, to thinking about how to, how to reduce risk in some of these areas, as opposed to a zone of shared risk being an entire town. Uh, there's been a lot of work uh, going on in the last few years. Circa has done some mapping zones of shared risk. And uh, this is a view on the right hand side. The left hand side is the existing web page, which you can go to and look at some of the mapping work that's been done. The right hand side is a view of New Haven and some of the flood based zones of shared risk that were sketched for, for the city last year. Here's a couple other images from Circa's work. Uh, this is specifically Peter Minuti's work at UConn. Um, he, he produced some of the mapping for Circa. So the upper image, upper left image on the right is some initial sketching that he did for city of Milford. You can see um, the southwest part of Milford was previously sketched into kind of four different zones of shared risk. And then if you look, follow the arrow to the right hand side, um, a further iteration of his work in Milford kind of linked those, those four areas together. So we'll talk about, you know, the pros and cons of having smaller areas versus larger areas as we go into the breakout rooms. Uh, there's also been a lot, of, a lot of work with Circa over the past year, um, presenting some of these concepts and trying to advance some of the discussions around how to use zones of shared risk. So perhaps you've been present for, for some of these discussions. This is a little snippet of a, a workshop that was um, dated in July, 2020, uh, put on by Alex Felsen. So this is just the cover page. And then on the right-hand side, you can see some of the zones of shared risk that were sketched for Bridgeport. So these are areas along the Quantic River and the downtown area. Elsewhere in that presentation, there was a good example from the Guilford Madison area. So this is Circle Beach Road, which is kind of the, the dead end of Neck Road, which is in Madison. The town line is not here on the screen, but you can imagine it goes it's, uh, north to south between Circle Beach and Neck Road. So the question really is, of how do you draw a zone of shared risk in this area? Is it all one? Is it two? Um, and, and the choice was kind of made to kind of make it two separate zones of shared risk. So the Neck Road folks, they don't flood as frequently and they have kind of a distinct way out of their neighborhood if they need to uh, towards Madison Center off the page to the right. Whereas the Circle Beach Road folks, some of them live in Guilford, which is a separate town. Um, the whole area can flood uh, you know, rather quickly, and there's only one way out, and that's through Neck, Neck Road, who might also be trying to evacuate at the same time. So it brings in questions of, um, you know, kind of how to, how to organize zones of shared risk. Also, were some examples in the presentation uh, about how to kind of use zones of shared risk for planning, and then some other drawings of zones of shared risk. The lower right-hand graphic is, um, is a part of South Norwalk, so you can see lots of different ways that you can uh, delineate zones of shared risk in the coastal flood zones. And then some of the sketching that was that Alex worked on for, for uh, South Norwalk involved looking at different types of concept designs to reduce risks in the area. So elevating roads, ele elevating buildings, elevating um, existing hard structures, that sort of thing. 
So kind of putting that all together, this was this was given to us, the consultant team, and and and, and we were charged with drawing more of these zones and, and marching kind of inland into the riverine communities. And well, some of the things that we found, we wanted to be consistent with work that was already completed by Yale, by UConn and by Circa. Right? We didn't want to reinvent the wheel. We wanted this to be effective in areas of coastal flood risk as well as riverine. We wanted the methodology to be repeatable across the target municipalities of the two counties. So there's 31, 32 towns that we're working with specifically to draw zones of shared risk. And those are the communities that have the TOD potential. We wanted to make sure that we delineated zones of shared risk that were somewhat blind relative to the underlying social vulnerabilities, right? So that's an important part of the CCVI, but we wanted to make sure that we would draw a zone of shared risk around an area that has social vulnerability as, an area, as well as an area that does not. It needed to be kind of independent of that. And we also wanted to draw zones of shared risk that considered other climate related hazards such as heat and wind. Um, we love our word bubbles. That's kind of a, the graphic on the right hand side is, is a count of all the different words that have been written and all the different discussions about zones of shared risk up to this point in time. And you can see some of the words that come out frequently are resilient, plan, land, coastal, area. So um, that should give you a sense for what we're trying to do here when we draw these zones of shared risk. Another, another view of the same word bubble on the right, but the threshold set differently. You can see risk, flood, coastal, and resilient regions are all big, big words that come out of the discussions to date on zones of shared risk. But again, we've already said, and, and you understand that we're not just looking at coastal zones of shared risk now, we're trying to do this in riverine areas as well. We looked at automatic, automated GIS methods for delineating zones, and we found that you know, it really was not going to be able to be something that we could just press go and then walk away from our computer and come back and have them delineated. There kind of needs to be a human element and user knowledge for doing this, the drawing of the zones of shared risk. For example, looking at the hazard mitigation plans and reading the words in the hazard mitigation plans about which areas have some kind of risk. We looked at potential flood-based criteria for zones of shared risk, and some of the things that we batted around were a zone of shared risk should have several buildings um, in them, or at least adjacent, perhaps a critical facility, like a fire station or a shelter or a hospital, um, or perhaps a segment of a collector or arterial roadway. We also looked at whether or not zones had a shared shelter or, or lacked a shelter, maybe a shared heating or cooling center, um, or medical facilities or, or lack of any of these things. We looked at uh, some power transmission and distribution and we're continuing to kind of get this information together so we could better understand some of the wind related hazards. Um, is there a lack of redundancy, generators, standby power, perhaps one zone of shared risk has a microgrid and another one does not. So that would kind of give them a different risk uh, profile. We also looked at water and wastewater commonalities such as whether or not there's sewer systems or septic systems, uh, public water or private wells. What about heat? So I already kind of revealed that we're going to be drawing zones of shared risk that also um, delineate urban heat index risks. Uh, there are a number of viewers out there that, that you can all look at, such as uh, Yale has a viewer to look at urban heat index and risk. This is a, a map right on the page right here I just grabbed from Bridgeport. You can see um, summer day surface urban heat index intensity. So the, the redder colors are indicative of um, you know, a lot of roads and rooftops that absorb heat and make it hotter. And then as you move away from the city center, kind of the cooler colors where the urban heat index risk is lower. So we took a look at that. And there are other viewers that are out there. Uh, Trust for Public Land, I believe, has a viewer. So we're taking a look at some of those as well. And then wind. Wind is really difficult to get at, um, especially because uh, when there's a power outage in a community, it's really easy to find out how many days on average the community lost power and, um, and how they worked with Eversource or UI to restore power, but it's really hard to figure out spatial patterns of wind risk and how that applies to power outages and other wind-related hazards and effects. So we did take a look at the hazard mitigation plans and we, I had forgotten, I was reminded that the Fairfield, Bridgeport and Stratford plans do not specifically mention areas of the greater wind risk, uh, whereas other plans do. So we're gonna have to work with all of you to understand kind of where repeated wind risk um, 
issues are coming up. And we can talk about that if we have time during the breakout sessions today. We've also heard that UI kind of has better mapping than Eversource, which is a good news, which is good news for, for this, this region um, with the UI involvement. So we might go back to them and see what we can get from them as well. So I'll take a quick look at the viewer tool in the time check. I think we're right on schedule. We're gonna break out into groups in about five minutes. And we're gonna take a look at those four examples that came out of the Guilford work from eight, nine years ago. So here's kind of a classic example of a location zone of shared risk, flood-based. So this is, uh, this is Lower West End in Bridgeport. So you can see Cedar Creek on the right-hand side of the image. And then um, the Lower West End is in the middle of the, the image. And the blue color, the green blue color is the, the current flood zone. And it, what makes this a zone of shared risk other than it being um, just kind of a, an area that floods? Why wouldn't we join it with another area that's adjacent? Well, you know, from working with the city, we know that this is kind of a functional area of its own. There are plans to kind of continue development and redevelopment in this area and address the risks in this area uh, kind of collectively and separately than what's going on nearby as part of Resilient Bridgeport project. So that's why you would draw this as, a, as its own zone of shared risk. Let's look at an access zone of shared risk and hopefully the folks on the phone from uh, Stratford recognize this. So Lordship is kind of a good example, kind of a very classic example, actually. A lot of the homes are, are on higher ground in the middle of the, um, the neighborhood. And, but the, everyone does share that same uh, concern about access and getting out before floods, because if a flood is occurring, you may not be able to. So kind of a good example of an access zone of shared risk. You'll see the, the lighter green colors there on the, in the sketch. And that's us trying to delineate kind of sub areas that have additional risk um, in addition to the access zone of shared risk. So for example, along Short Beach Road, um, which is a light green color at the top of the image, they, that area of course needs to evacuate and get out before flooding occurs at Main Street, but it also can flood directly. A proximity zone of shared risk, the kind of a good example is downtown Fairfield. So uh, even though Laura informed us that flooding might be partly addressed by the previous uh, pavement that's been installed recently, um, flooding does still occur in this area. And it is not a map flood zone. We understand that and we do understand why flooding occurs. It's kind of near map flood zones, which is where the stormwater eventually does discharge. So this is a good example of the proximity zone of shared risk. And then wanted to just grab an example of a natural protection zone of shared risk. So this is kind of going back to Lordship, but looking further to the west. Um, we've included the, the tidal wetland area um, in, the, in a zone of shared risk delineation. You know, some might say, well, why would you include that area? There's no houses in it. Uh, but it does provide some buffering and protection to areas that are developed to the north. So we just wanted to kind of give you an example of, of why this matters and why we're looking at zones of shared risk in the CCBI. And we'll talk about this um, in about a half an hour when we, when we come back out of our breakout rooms. But wanted to just bring your attention to something that's outside the region, of course, Meriden is not part of MetroCog. But if you've ever heard about a Meriden Green, it's a, it's a downtown Meriden area that was continuously flooded for decades. It was developed and largely impervious. Harbor Brook was in a culvert, so it was not visible to the eye, it was underground, and flooding was chronic. And if you look at the CCVI mapping for that part of downtown Meriden on the left-hand side, you can see the darker red colors along Harbor Brook, indicative of the floodplain and, and greater density of buildings. And then if you look at the right-hand side of this page, it's kind of how we would draw a zone of shared risk for that area, independently of the CCVI. So we might take the, uh, the green delineation for flood based and draw it around the Harbor Brook floodplain. You also can see kind of the red color there, which is the urban heat island uh, mapping that we have for Meriden. And you can see that the two kind of overlap. There's also a railroad station, there's TOD potential in the area. So what would you do if it was, if Meriden Green had not been kind of redeveloped yet and you were looking at the CCVI and the zones of shared risk together in your mind, could you think of a project that would help make that area uh, more resilient. And so what we have in Meriden Green is an example of, of that having been done. So um, the stream was daylighted, a park was developed to accept some of the flooding, 
Um, this is adjacent to an area of TOD potential. The Meriden Railroad Station uh, is very close by. And um, this is kind of held up as an example of a successful resilience project. So downtown Meriden is kind of adapting to the flooding and climate change while uh, addressing its TOD potential and not ignoring it. So that's kind of where we're going with, with um, the CCBI and the zones of shared risk eventually is kind of putting them together, overlaying them and identifying projects. All right, um, Noah, are we all back? Yeah. Okay, I'll go ahead and do the report out for Fairfield. Okay, so we had a discussion about a lot of things and I don't know how I'm gonna mention them all, but I'll try. Um, we talked a lot about typologies for zones of shared risk and how we're trying to capture, what we're really trying to do is capture different typologies and how that can, how we can use that to, to benefit the projects that are identified later. So for example, one idea that Emmeline had is all the railroad underpasses could be one other kind of new sort of zone of shared risk for all the communities, not just Fairfield, so that they're all addressed kind of in the same way. And Victoria, this came up with you with Darian last week, and, and we kind of looked at it on a, as a one-off, but if we look at all of those the same in all the communities and make them all maybe a new kind of zone of shared risk, that might be beneficial um, down the road. We also talked a lot about um, some of the riverine risk areas in Fairfield in Reno Rooster River, which is a problem shared with Bridgeport to a large extent, um, has kind of a very different housing profile and risk profile than coastal zones. And it might be adv advantageous to kind of um, cast those, of shared, those zones of shared risk in a different way towards acquisitions and floodplain lands being set aside as opposed to a coastal area that might be kind of geared more towards elevating homes and roads. So that's something that we need to work on kind of going forward is making sure that the, the two kinds of zones of shared risk, even though they're both location zones of shared risk are kind of characterized differently so that projects that come out of them are appropriately different. We spent some time looking at the Fairfield TOD area at the, the, um, the railroad station, which is the newer one, Metro Fairfield. Talked about the TOD study that was done a couple of years ago and how that's a good example of an area where more dense housing can be developed and it may be an area that people move to from areas of retreat in Fairfield and other towns. And so we talked a lot about how to make that area more resilient, um, which is which is perfect. That's just where we want to head with this project is making the TOD areas more resilient and able to accept people moving from other areas that are that are less resilient. We, and that's only not even doing it justice, but I think I'll move on and let <laughs> I'll let the Bridgeport team go um, with their report out. We had a lot of really good comments too. Yeah. Writing fast and furiously, so I'm gonna bear with me as I interpret my notes. But um, we started off talking about projects, be, uh, regional projects between different municipalities, and how the tool is valuable to kind of you know zoom out and identify those uh, those potential areas and the projects that could could address regional concerns. Uh, question came up about multiple hazards, how that might change the, the equation or, or reshape some of the zones of shared risk. And one example, there were many, but one example that was given is, for example, the pandemic and sheltering in place as opposed to, to getting to shelters or distance to shelters and, and how those types of, of things could play in and, and bringing in sort of more of the response element to the, even though this is geography-based, identify some of the response elements that impact those those areas, which I believe is sort of, it, which is sort of done with the CCBI. So it was a good example of, of combining the two. Um, we looked at some areas in, along the train station in Stratford and, and identified the different, various different uh, areas of shared risk. And then there was a discussion about um, critical facilities and what could be included uh, strong feelings that landfills should be included. And then how, the question was asked, how does this interact uh, with this uh, state emergency operation plan in terms of consistency between um, 
critical facilities in particular, but again, back to that issue of, of response. Um, there were some discussion about using the FEMA defined critical facilities, again, for consistency, potentially putting rings of color around critical facilities to make them stand out more. Um, and the whole idea of making the tool engage people who in the mitigation community and the management community who uh, drive grant making decisions. And then we closed out with a discussion on moving from zones of shared risk to, or the question was asked, should they be renamed to zones of opportunity? And we had a discussion about the next steps and how we'll be using, using these tools that we've previewed today to, to move towards uh, sort of a shorter list of opportunity zones. Uh, Katie or John, I missed anything. Oh, uh, one last thing. <laughs> we just closed with uh, Don made the comment, and we all agreed that the, the next the next step of community engagement with the stakeholders within the specific communities will be um, kind of critical a critical component to shaping the zones of risk. All right, so let's see our Stratford group. Um, we had we also had a, a, a great discussion, a lot. Um, we talked about a lot, so I'll, I'll just try to hit some of the highlights. Um, we, we started out kind of looking at the, the TOD zone in Stratford and discussion of some of the ongoing efforts around complete streets. Um, and then it was pointed out um, the relationship between some of the drainage issues um, in the northern part of Stratford, uh, specifically, I've got here Broad Street um, in that area and the relationship between that and the, the flooding downstream and the low elevation spots in Stratford and that that was something we sort of missed in our delineation of zones of shared risk in Stratford. So we'll have to go back and look at that. Um, kind of this interconnectivity between the drainage issues upstream and then downstream came up in a couple of places. Um, then we we got into some specifics around the area of lordship and kind of the evacuation routes uh, between that area through the the flood zone and and um, to the upland areas in Stratford and uh, got into this kind of discussion of uh, the long term vision of how. Uh, this community is going to get out of harm's way during storms and kind of like that longer term vision. Um, and there's a number of different elements, project elements, planning projects that have been defined uh, to, to raise a, a greenway um, along the river there. Uh, but then some of the challenges around uh, funding um, and sort of the local community finding match funding uh, dealing with some of the frustrations of, uh, you know, applying for grants, federal grants in particular, uh, how it would be really great to have a, a state fund that could um, assist in this efforts. And we, we talked a little bit about Massachusetts, some other state programs like that. Um, but then kind of the, the planners and the folks that are working on this in Stratford kind of, you know, have are putting this information in front of developers, um, in front of the political decision makers, and some of the challenges of kind of breaking through that part of the communication that we really need to take this zones of shared risk mapping and make it much more widely understood, um, possibly even have more of a, a legal framework uh, going forward um, to you know, kind of affect that policy decision making in terms of development um, in in Stratford. Then we we talked a little bit about coordination, the regional coordination being needed. Uh, discussion of Bridgeport actually, and some ideas for coordination between Stratford and Bridgeport. And we looked at the Bruce Brook, and I think we we sort of got cut off with um, we we're getting an update on some project ideas um, along the Bruce Brook area and how that could be a good place to coordinate between Stratford and Bridgeport. Uh, Victoria or Joanna, anything else? 
You got it. Okay. So we are, we're in our, our end of the workshop at this point, and we want to leave some time for open discussions. And I feel like of all the workshops we've had, this is the one where we might have some open discussions. So that's exciting. But before we get to that point, um, wanted to just touch on how we're putting this all together. We've kind of been dancing around it and we've hinted at it. John, John talked about it at 930 and then we've talked about it a little bits of it since then. But um, as you have come to understand over the course of, of this workshop um, in, in prior workshops in the, in the Circus Summit in the fall, we've been kind of collecting lots of information from hazard mitigation plans and various state and federal layers and tools that Circa has put together. And all these different factors are being used to help us with the CCVI. And we're kind of grouping those different factors, social, built, et cetera, into exposure, sensitivity, and adaptive capacity. And we've talked about kind of how we did that. And we, we picked through the tool today in the breakout sessions and, and we have a little bit more work to do on kind of refining that. Um, but suffice to say that the, you know, the CCVI will, will continue to be used as refined for planning as we go forward. Um, but we're also taking all those individual factors uh, that we've been talking about and using them to draw zones of shared risk. And so the next thing that we need to do as we refine and kind of better delineate those zones of shared risk is overlay it with the CCVI so that we can help prioritize those zones of shared risk to become opportunities and projects. So that's where this is headed. Um, we talked a lot about that final step in our, our breakout room a few minutes ago, and it sounds like the Bridgeport, Trumbull, and uh, Fairfield, uh, Stratford rooms also talked about opportunities and projects coming up. So it's good to know that everybody is thinking ahead on this project overall. Um, we, uh, let's advance, there we go. Um, have a couple immediate next steps and then come kind of a couple long term. So in the short term, we will continue some engagement with everybody in the meeting today and um, additional in the other COGS as well, incorporate feedback into the CCVI. For example, we need to go back and check out some of the um, individual contributor layers and make sure that they're in there correctly and then incorporate feedback on the zones of shared risk. I know for my part, the folks in Fairfield would like to sit down and go through some of those in more detail. So that can happen pretty soon. And then kind of going forward, additional ways to provide feedback, um, use the brief survey that was circulated prior to, to the workshop that Victoria sent out. You can always reach us directly, uh, email or phone. Um, there's going to be a story map, which is I think in its final stages of edits and almost ready for release. Um, and then that'll be something that you can find on Circa's website and you can provide uh, feedback there as well. Uh, we'll have additional appearances in front of the COG board and subcommittee meetings. There are three this week. We have a West COG meeting tomorrow and then a couple of SCROG meetings. Perhaps some of you on the phone have seen us in some of the RPC and TTAC meetings and we'll continue to provide, provide updates in those meetings. We are looking ahead at additional workshops and webinars. Uh, we're hoping to actually uh, present some of the heat related um, findings, urban heat index related findings in a webinar coming up in wind, if we can kind of uh, get our arms around that since we focused on flooding today. And then let us know if you think that there's an opportunity to host an information session for your own community. We could come down and do a presentation or virtually as it were, get more information in front of you. Um, and so that's it. I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing. And uh, I know there's a couple questions in the chat box. Um, I'll check those now. I do have. There's... Go ahead. Well, as I was gonna say, a quick end of um, workshop poll too before folks um, scatter. Uh, so I do want to do that. But again, we still do have time for open discussion. So I'll put that up. Folks can uh, respond to that. And then if you have any other questions, we can talk about those while it's up. Um, and then mo and I think most of the breakouts, we all got around to asking kind of how you would use these tools in your work, um, but conversation was so productive that we didn't even get to those. So just to get an idea how folks might use the zones of shared risk or the CCI in their work. 
Um, but again, we can answer any other questions too while this is running. So if you have anything or any other comments or feedback, you know, we'd love to take that right now. And I think most folks should be able to unmute. I think you can raise your hand or if you want to put anything in the chat, if there's anything, we can um, address it. Don Watson here, can you hear me? Yep. Yes. So great work, uh, big recommendation. At the town level, engineers and planners are asked to go to this meeting, that meeting, every which meeting. To the extent that you can coordinate it with the legal requirements to annually update the town's natural hazard mitigation plan and also the town's engagement with the state emergency operation plan, which the fire and police and emergency responders attend to. So those are typical of either regulatory or advisory requirements very closely related. And of all the incentives, the FEMA community rating system gives towns the incentive to look at whole town opportunities. Even if you may be improving one sector of a town, your investment or your town's investment in that small neighborhood sector can lower the insurance rates for the uh, flooding for the entire town. So the extent that this planning tool and the meetings that you have can make it easy for each town to coordinate their natural hazard mitigation plan review requirements and their state emergency operation plan requirements, you're going to have happier campers and more effective involvement. And great to see this. Thanks. <laughs> That's good feedback, thank you. Okay. Anyone else? If not, I'll close the poll in just a second. Any other questions? All right, <clears throat> let's take a look at the poll. Um, so how might you envision using the zones of shared risk in your work? Uh, let's see, project planning, site, Siting design, uh, looks like most folks said strategic planning or priority setting. Um, good application and grant and outreach. Those are, those are two important aspects of it. And then kind of general decision making. Um, and pretty similar for the CCBI, community outreach and strategic planning being the top two winners. But again, general decision making and, and planning and um, grant support. Uh, where would you like to see Resilient Connecticut moving? Uh, narrowing down concrete pilot projects. Good. That just reaffirms the work we'll be doing over the next few months anyway, so that's good to hear. Um, but yeah, developing these zones a little bit better in the CCVI, uh, which I think is important. We're going to take a lot of this feedback and, um, you know, further develop these tools. So, and I didn't share. As I'm going through the results, I didn't even share them. I'm selfish, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, but no, that's that's good because I think a lot of, uh, a lot of what, we, what came out of these workshops is I'm gonna help finalize that and, and drive the rest of Resilient Connecticut. So, uh, great. All right, I'll stop that. And anything else? No, I don't see anything in the chat. So, although, Her well, Harold did ask if it could be incorporated into an EIS. I'm not sure, Harold, if you're referring to the, the, Bruce, Book, the Bruce Brook project. I think that's a more concentrated uh, conversation you're looking for, maybe with Kelly, right? Great. Oh, and so in general, Harold, is that what you mean for the CCBI and the zones of shared risk? I just wanna make sure I'm understanding. Yes, okay. Um, so, uh, you're right. So could this be incorporated into an EIS? Um, I guess, I mean, potentially, um, you know, I, I'll admit I'm not in, entirely educated on what exactly goes into the EIS, um, but I think, you know, breaking out kind of the ecological components, um, you know, and taking a look at the underlying data, I think a lot of this could be, you know, could be broken apart or broken down into levels that are usable for, you know, say an EIS or any other specific planning effort. 
I think it's kind of the beauty of, of both of these tools, right? You break it out to what you want, but also put it back together for kind of more general, um, you know, general use. I don't know if... Yeah, I think that makes sense. With the EISs, you're oftentimes relying on many different plans that are already right. in existence. And, and to the extent that the, the final report from Resilient Connecticut will be published and supported by Circa, it would be something that could be looked at right. as one is writing an EIS. But okay. it wouldn't have... It, it wouldn't be an adopted plan like the state in POCB. It would be something different than that. It would be another layer to look at. Right. Other questions, comments? So we've got some follow-up to do with, with all of you and, and we, will, we will work on that. If, following on the EIS comment, I think that one of the benefits of this tool is it does help you look at the alternatives when you are looking at the alternative project, it won't give you the impact onto you know, the spotted salamander in a particular brook, but it will help you try to, to compare different projects um, and give a little bit more of the social context for sure. Mm -hmm. All right, that's a good point, thank you. All right, anyone else? If not, I think we can adjourn for the day. Good, all right. All right. Well, thank you all very much. As Dave mentioned, you know, reach out by email or anything like that. And then just keep an eye out for uh, post-workshop uh, information. So, and we look forward to uh, reconvening in a few months for another set of workshops. So. Thank you, everybody. Tori, just one point. Uh, we do on our website uh, for the workshops have a feedback form if you want to provide more right. specific feedback about the mapping tools that you saw today. And we'll follow up with all the workshop participants to, yeah. to give that link. So there is a continued opportunity to provide that kind of feedback. Great. That known. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, thanks. We'll get that out to everyone, Katie. Appreciate it. Thanks, all. Have a good one. Take care. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.